Good morning. I'm so happy to be able to, to come today again in the name of Jesus to bring another lesson. This is the last lesson for this month. And it says, uh, re return to love and justice. Let us pray. Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight of God, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson today is coming from Hosea, the 11th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Then it fast forward to 7 through 10. It fast forwards again to 12, verse, chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and verses 6 through 14. The adult topic says, measure up, measure up. And the reason why this passage is so uh, needed now is because people often equate prosperity with righteousness. Is, is prosperity the standard by which people and society should be judged? Well, Jose is going to let us know that love and justice are God's standard. Love and justice are God's standards. Upon, upon completing this particular lesson, we want to practice love and justice as our key virtue. And this is our objective, to practice love and justice as a key virtue. And we can see the result today of what is happening in the world. Because the world is not measuring up to God's standard, we have words in just about, um, in across, and we're making national news because of the not measuring up. The judicial system is not measuring up. As a result of it, you have crime, you have lies going on because of injustice. Injustice is being done. We have injustice when a man from Louisiana spent 37 years and incarcerated for a crime that he did not commit it and found out that he was not the person and was released. Injustice. Injustice by the judicial system. This is going on today, and we are we are uh, a part of the system. We're part of the system, and we feel the pain. For those that are going through the ride, yes, they cry. Yes, I'm tired and I'm angry of the injustice. Of course, the way they are handling it is not the proper way. God stands and say love and justice, and they have to do it the right way. Let's look at the lesson content. The book, uh, Jose is the writer of the book of Jose, and the word, his meaning, the name is salvation. Jose is a prophet, a minor prophet, and he's of domestic distress. And he, he often is referred to as a, a home missionary because of his, lived, his condition that he went through with, with his wife caused him to, uh, to be able to stand up and talk with authority. To get Israel to see the error of their ways, God commanded Hosea to, to take a wife, Goma, who became unfaithful to him. And that was in verses 1 and 2. In chapter 1, verse 2, chapter um, and 3, and then chapter 2 and 5. Then he said, he also, the children, he had two children, and their name stood for disaster. And their, the symbol was also the symbol of, of Jose's message. So he had things that was happening right in the house that he could parallel with in talking and to, the, uh, to the Israelites. His experience, each experience Jose had in his home, gave him a picture of Israel's experience in spiritual adultery spiritual adultery, falling away from God. This circumstance enabled him to speak with authority. When you've gone through something and you've walked that walk, then you can talk about it. When he reprimanded the, the, the Israelites, he was able to tell them about their sin because he was living in a situation. His ministry was to the northern kingdom of Israel, and he chiefly prophesied to the ten tribes of Israel. 
He reproved them for their sin. He exalted them to repent. He threatened them with, with destruction in case they they uh, they did not want to listen to what he had to say. And he also gave stroke to those that uh, that were doing what they were supposed to be doing. Okay, and with and letting them know that the promise of the Messiah. Uh, would come in the latter days. This all began <clears throat> with the northern kingdom, first king, with Je Jeroboam, and that is in first king, chapter 12, <clears throat> verses 12 to 33. The first four verses of Hosea, of chapter 11, Hosea the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 4, is a picture of a father's tender love. A picture of a father's tender love and he says when Israel was a child then I love him and as a father loving his child all right chapter 11 opened with a new note all right in the past chapter it emphasized on this behavior of God's people but now the new note is God is talking about his love for, for his his children and how wonderful he is to them. And God said to Jose in chapter 1 and 2, He said, said to Jose, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredom, and the children of whoredom, for the land had committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he wanted him to experience what he was going to be teaching them about, what, they were, what he was going to be uh, uh, instructing them about. Okay. In that first verse, you see God's mercy for his children. He said, I loved them when they was a child, as a child. Then I loved them, and I called them my son, he said, and out of Egypt. Of, of God, parental love. Despite their ingratitude, God reminded them that he called them his son out of Egypt. All right, and he called them out of Egypt, and that is in Exodus, the third chapter verses 6 through 10, of parents' love. He will always love his children, all right? They were backsliding. They were backsliding. And backsliding is no more than refusing to listen to God and refusing to come back to him, all right? They were backsliding. Even though God was very good to them and he loved them, they had ingratitude. They, were very, they did not have an attitude of gratitude, all right? Then we go back to verses, uh, uh, verse 8 and 9. We see a father compassionate love. All right, we see the tender love in the first one. Then we come back in 8 and 9, and we see uh, a, a compassionate love. He said, how shall I give thee up? Compassion for them. He said, uh, for the uh, 9 said, how shall I give thee up? Ephraim, how shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as a uh, Amma? How shall I set thee as Zomba, Zebum? My heart is turning within me, and my repentance are kindling together. He said, how can I? How can I give them up? He doesn't want to give them up because God loves us. He loved them. Because, because of their sin, he must judge them. All right, that's in eight and nine. He didn't, he's not. He said, "I will not abandon them." This is the mercy of God. He said, "I can't abandon them." You know, even though they are doing what they're not supposed to do, he said, "I love them, and I don't want to abandon them." Ephraim is a son of Joseph, also a descendant, and in their territory, and he referred to them as Ephraim. All right. And uh, Amiah, Amiah, and Zebum were cities that were destroyed by God. And he didn't want to destroy them. That is in Genesis 10 and 19. He didn't want to destroy them like he destroyed that city. God had a divine compassion for Israel. He says he had a, design, a, a divine, or he was divine, and he had a forbearing. His, his forbearing was divine. He was long-suffering and mercy. And, he, and as he thought about that, 
even though he was he was thinking about the judgment that he should bring against him, that divine nature of him took over. That's in verse eight, okay? God promised he would not wipe them out. He would not alienate them. He would not annihilate them. All right? Totally. But he wasn't going to let them get by. That's in verse 9. Okay? Because of God's character, his inflammable, his holiness, he would not punish them as he intended. But that's in verse 9. And he said, I will not excuse the fire furious of my anger. He wasn't going to excuse it. He was going to deal with it. But guess what? He wasn't going to wipe them out totally. Okay? He wasn't going to wipe them out totally. After God dis displayed uh, uh, his wrath and his compassion for them, they responded by promising to walk after God. That's in verse 10. He said, They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. He said, uh, they're going to they're gonna, uh, respond and walk after me in verse 10. He said, God's voice would be like a rolling lion because he was so angry. When he would speak to, to those in exile, they would tremble from the west. And God intends to judge them Judgment was upon them, upon the nation in the West. And they said, uh, the United States happens to be west of the land of Israel. All right? But he wasn't going to let them get by. He was going to judge them. Okay? He's not going to let us get by. He will judge us. He won't wipe us out to give us a chance because he is a loving God. He's a merciful God. But at the same time, he will not let us go unpunished. So we're talking about a compassionate God. We're talking about a tender, loving God. We're talking about a compassionate God. All right. Then we skip on down to, to go fast forward to chapter 12, verses uh, 1 and 2. Chapter 12 continues with God's statement of judgment against Israel. All right. In chapter 12, he starts off and he says, uh, he tells them that Ephraim, Feeded on wind and followed after the east wind. And here God is describing the sin of his people uh, in, that, in that first verse. They were vanity. They were unsatisfied. They had false hope. They were evil. They had evil intention. They were deteriorating. They had social injustice. They, they were forming uh, foreign allegiance with Egypt and Assyria. And he had forbidden that. God is, is just in all his ways. And he was not going to stand for that. In that, 12, in that first verse, he spelled out some of the stuff that they were doing. God is a just God. In Deuteronomy 32 and 4, so God is a just God. And he loved truth. And he loved honesty. And he loved justice. And then he said, he had commanded Israel to measure up to the standard by showing concern for the welfare of the poor and afflicted. Measure up in what you're doing. And that's that's in Deuteronomy 10 and 8. He asked them to measure up. He gave them so many chances to measure up. But they still were stiff-necked and hard-hearted, and they didn't want to measure up. Doesn't that sound just like us? Stiff-necked and hard-hearted, and God is trying to give us all kinds of chances to measure up. And he's still blessing us day after day. In addition, they had, they had been forbidden to form an allegiance with the foreign nation. And that was in Exodus 23, and 30, 23 verse 33. Because of the danger, why? Because of the danger of them being influenced. He knew that they would be going to be influenced because it was young and tender by other adulterous religious practice. And that's why he did not want them to form uh, allegiance with the foreign nation. God was the only source. He wanted to be the only source of what they, they, they would ever need. They would ever need. He wanted to be their only source. But instead, they did otherwise. Ephraim feeded on the wind. In that first verse, he said, Ephraim feeded on the wind and followed after the east wind. And this is a re re uh, re reference 
to the east wind which come over the burning uh, Arabian desert land, blowing through that land. And God is saying, I intend to let the, the Assyrian come through the land just like the east wind, uh, getting rid of them. Uh, God expected them to repent and return to their covenant God and live by love and justice. That was in that, that sixth verse. Therefore, turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. And that's what he was asking them to do. That was a commandment to them. Some of God, some of the people were becoming rich using economic dis, dishonesty. They pride and they were very insensitive to the sins. They just thought they weren't doing anything uh, wrong. Seven says, he, he as a merchant, the, the balance of the deceit are in his hand, and he loved to oppress. They were doing everything, all right? They were being dishonest. They were being, they were causing distress, and they were insensitive, all right? The result of, of their repentance, though, would be a reversal to their attitude and their behavior. Once they repented, they would not uh, commit those those acts of sin in the way that they did. And God knew that. So this is why he was trying to get them to, to have the prophet to talk to them to become, uh, to repent. Because they were doing too many things that was causing him to get angry every day. They would discontinue economic dishonesty if they repent. Their pride would not, they wouldn't be boasting about their, their richness and their insensitivity to, to sin. That was, that's in verse 7 and 8, all right? The northern kingdom was boasting about their wealth. The nation, because they had entangled themselves from God, because they had strayed away from God, and they had developed the mistaken idea that their wealth and prosperity hid their sin from God. I don't care how rich you get. I don't care how much you have. That will never hide your sin from God. Because God is not interested in that. God is interested in your heart. And he wants you to be just and loving. God has been, had been observing them since he brought them from Egypt. And was, there was nothing going to overlook their disobedient attitude and their arrogant ingratitude. They were very arrogant in, with their attitude. And they did not want to do what thus said the Lord. And so therefore, he wasn't going to dismiss it. He wasn't going to wipe them out, but he wasn't going to dismiss it. God is saying to Israel in, in that ninth verse, he said, uh, in the ninth verse, he said, And I that am the Lord thy God of the land of Egypt would ye make thee to dwell in the tabernacle as in the days of the solemn feast. He is saying here that I am not through with you yet. I'm not going to give up on you, but I'm not through with you yet. Because guess what? You will, you definitely will turn back to me. God reminded Israel, Israel that he had been with, been there, that he had been their God since he brought them out of Egypt. He would punish them like he did their ancestors while they were in the wilderness. And they would have to live in tents while they were in exile. And then that's what verse 9 is talking about, okay? Israel was without excuse because God communicated his, express, his expectation through his prophets. And that's verse 10. We are not without excuse, excuse because God has given us leaders that are standing up tall and speaking the word of God. So there is no excuse. Communication of a God expectation is going forth every day. Are we really listening? Are we listening to the expectations of God? They, they were given their expe expectation through the prophets. The verse 10. The prophets they gave them the prophets gave them instruction. Twelve line prophets came through that trying to get them to see what thus said the Lord. They gave them instructions. They gave them pictures of the, the, the vision that God had for them. 
And then you come back in that 11 verse and he said, Is there iniquity in Galilee? In Galilee is the place where there should have been a bomb to heal the wound. But instead, it was a place of sin. That's in that verse 11. That verse 11. And it become a horror place. Fury of the fear. It was a beautiful place at one time. But it became a place of horror. It became a place of sin. It became a place where people wanted to go and do their dirt. All right? The nation ignored the prophets. And they plunged deeper into the idolatry. And they increased the number of... Uh, they made many more altars across the land. So they were doing their thing. They were more or less rebelling. Okay? Plunging, ignoring what the prophets had to say. Okay? And, then, and God gave them a chance. A number of chances. Chances over chances. Many, many chances. Just like He's giving us many, many chances. And because He's so loving, so kind, we use that as an excuse. And then we come back and we say, Oh, God is so merciful. And He won't do this and He won't do that. You know? No, God isn't going to annihilate us, but God is definitely going to punish. And he said, we won't, he will discipline us. In the coming judgment, he said that uh, the stones that they were using to, uh, to build these altars would be scattered and reduced to pile of stones. That's in verse 11. Is there iniquity in your life? He said, and in the last part, yes, their altars are as heat in the fury of the fear. In other words, he's going to destroy them. All right? It's going to, all these altars are going to be destroyed and scattered all over the place. And they're going to be reduced to pile of stones. Uh, and, and and they would not be the same figure that they had, that they thought of, or they, they worship. okay? God was going to destroy it. Jose, in the last part of that, that uh, chapter, Jose kept on reminding the Israelites to be humble. They had a humble beginning. And God, and he also brought them back in memory and told them that God goodness, about God goodness to them. In other words, wanting them to reflect back on how God was good to them and how God, uh, uh, how faithful he was to them. God is so good to us. He is so faithful to us. Why would we not want to measure up? Huh? And he kept telling them that. You got a good God. He loves you. He's merciful to you. But still you plunder. You're plunging deeper and deeper into sin. Huh? Trying to get them to change their will. He used Jacob, their ancestor, as the object lesson to illustrate God's faithfulness. Which was in verse 12. He told him about Jacob. He said that, And Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for a, uh, and Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. And we know the story of it is of the Jacob and what happened and how he had to serve to get his wife, and he thought he had the right wife, and it come out to find out he had the, the wrong wife. He had to go back and serve again. Huh? He said, but he said, and he could be proud of bring that to uh, to give them something to to look at and to pitch and portrait in their mind. All right, and let them know that uh, that uh, God is a, a faithful God. God is a loving God, and the purpose of him using that illust illustration was to encourage them to humble themselves, repent. And obey so they would continue to receive God's blessing. And that's the cry today. We are sending the same message. Every minister, every disciple of God is sending out the same message. If we not, we should be telling a dying world that there is reality in serving a true and a living God. Repent. I don't care what it is you've done. Repent and obey God. 
so that you can continue to receive God's blessing. Because God is awesome. God is good. And he blesses us continuously. Israel refused and provoked God anger. They did not want to measure up. They did not want to measure up. Despite God's love, he was not going to extend his forgiveness and let the nation remain guilty, but would repay them for their sins. And that's what 14 says. He's going to repay them for their sins. We have to keep in mind that God's love will not prevent him from executing his divine judgment. we got to keep that in mind. God can be relied upon as a loving father. But his expectation is that his children measure up by obeying his command. This lesson should motivate us to examine our quality, all right, and the depth of our love and commitment to God's command. Measure up is an ongoing challenge in, in every area of society. Measuring up is not hard if we follow God's standard. Measure up is reminding that Pleasing God is not automatic, and it cannot be taken lightly, especially in light of his requirement for demonstrating love and justice. The first requirement for measuring up to any of God's standards is obeying his word, desiring to submit to his will, and acknowledging him as the source of all that we have. If we want to measure up, these are the things that we have to do. Obey his word, submit to his, his will, and acknowledge him as the source of all that we are doing, or all that we have accomplished in life. God judges our standing with him by the depths of our love for him, and how much we prove that love by loving others and promoting justice to all. How do you measure up? today. Measure according to God's standard. Question, what indictment can God justifiably bring against his people today regarding his expectation of them? Ponder the question. Are you measuring up to God's standards? May God bless you and may God keep you. This is my prayer. And let us pray. Dear God, dear Lord, help us, help us ever to look to you for all the good and perfect gifts that come down to us. Help us to keep a perspective on the things that are truly, that truly matters in life. Do not let us confuse material success with spiritual death. Keep before us a sense of right and wrong in our dealing with one another. And help us ever to look to you for the model of what truly constitutes justice and righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you and may God keep you. This is my prayer again. Let's measure. God bless you.